say thank you to WIDA for the opportunity to share my views in this book, and in particular, thank Tony and Alan for their leadership in coordinating this project. I think the story of the extractive in, the, in a lot of the uh, you know, low-income countries can be summed up in a, a kind of a, a folklore in Ghana, a Ghanaian folklore that is about the hunter and the game. And this is how it goes, that we are happy with the game of the hunter. We really love the soup prepared out of the game of the hunter, but we really are disgusted by the dress of the hunter. So if you, the outfit really disgusts us, but we want to eat the, the, you know, the product of, of his game. I think it is the same with most government who really are happy to get the foreign exchange, they're happy to get the, the, the revenues, uh, and so on and so forth, but really are disgusted by either the perceived or the real negativities of the extractives. And for that reason, sometimes they are deprived of the opportunity to really understand, fully understand the, the, you know, the full story of the extractive. I think that's, that's, that's really the, 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 the crux of the matter. So what I sought to do in the book was to say that, look, let's... Um, Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I was singing the, 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 folklore, the folkloric song from my head. Now, <laughs> now um, what, what I sought to do in, in, in the book was to say that, look, let's accept the reality that there's, there's, there's huge potential in using the extractives as a basis for sort of catalyzing development and transformation in these regions. And that, um, I mean, the, the, the transmit, transformative power uh, that is inherent in, 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 in the extractive actually depends on the kind of regulations that you have. So in, in, in effect, what, what I argue is that at the heart of the trans, uh, transformative role of, of a resource exploitation is an effective regulatory framework. So I, I guess that's, that's the key thing, and I'm not going to bore you with definitions of what a regulation is and all that because it's all in the, in the books. So, but suffice it to say that they are just the rules of the game. And of course, um, you, if, you, if you come up with a regulation, you expect to influence the eventual outcome. And that uh, a well-functioning regulatory system must be balanced. It must have accountability, transparency, and uh, consistency. Now, Again, we all know the benefit of uh, effective regulatory framework because obviously it will guide the promotion of investment in the sector. It will also help establish procedures and uh, help manage the utilization of the resources. So basically, there are benefits in using regulation uh, as tool for uh, uh, resource transformation. Uh, so, so basically, that's, that's what we're looking at. Now, let me focus on Ghana. I am sure people know Ghana. I mean, for those who, who have read history, you knew Ghana first as Gold Coast, just reflecting the perceived uh, uh, insatiable amount of gold that, 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 that was there. Um, I don't know whether it is true or not, but, but suffice it to say that Ghana is uh, you know, resource, resource rich. It's uh, known for gold, bauxite, manganese, and diamonds and um, other industrial minerals. In fact, in about 10 years ago, the European Union provided some resources to government to do a broad airborne geophysical studies, which actually came up with uh, a number of other minerals which were previously unknown, uh, I think about 28 of them. So the potential is quite great. But I think also that for Ghana, there has been a bit of exaggeration of how much you know, the, the minerals really support the economy. They do support the economy, but how much, how many minerals we have and how it, it affects the economy. For instance, if you look at the four major minerals that have been mined, that is bauxite, gold, manganese, and diamond, over the years at commercial rate, um, you see that gold constitutes about 95% of the value. So the total value of the minerals is dominated by gold. So effectively, we are a mono-mineral economy, if you like. I mean, in terms of value. But that, that, that is not to say that gold is not a significant mineral there. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last uh, about 30 years or so, we have um, 
the mineral sector bringing in close to 17 billion in investment to Ghana and, and is still the leader in uh, attracting investment into the country. In terms of production, we know that uh, for, for uh, Africa, it is the uh, number two to South Africa. And then uh, it's also about eight, it's been oscillating between eight to 11 in terms of the, the, the world league. Um, I also am careful about exaggeration because sometimes we are number two to South Africa. But until recently, if you saw the gap between the amount of gold produced by South Africa and that produced by Ghana, it would sound like uh, children who wrote exams, one got 87, the other got 28. 87 was first, 28 was second. And so you go out to say, mommy, I was second in class. You know, the gap is quite big. But of course, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's closing, closing up slowly because you know, South Africa's good production has been going down. So, so, so that's what it is. And in terms of revenue, um, uh, you know, over the years, it's, it's moved. In fact, if you look at the data from the 1980s, you realize how much uh, the mineral sector has been con contributing in terms of internal revenue to the government. And um, last year or so, we were about 16% of total revenue. In fact, it peaked in 2012, where the mining sector alone contributed about 27% of the internal revenue. It is still the leading contributor of internal revenue. Sometimes, government even forget. And when they are talking about um, uh, sectors that produce internal revenue, they even forget to mention mining even though that's really the leading uh, 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 contributor. Um, employment is a, very, a bit controversial. Uh, people have been arguing that since Ghana moved from underground mining to open pit mining, the number of people directly employed has reduced. This might be true technically, but if you look at the level of outsourcing that has gone on, you see an increase in employment in other sectors. That's an area, this, this afternoon a colleague from Ghana did a presentation and I drew his attention to that side, which probably may be a hiding uh, because you may have a sector that is actually working only for the mining sector. But if you're looking for the contributions, you will look elsewhere. And so that's, that's, that's what it, I see a paper coming, so I better move on. Uh, let me just quickly go back to. So we, we've, we've indicated the kind of contributions that uh, the industry has been seeing uh, I mean, bacon in Ghana. Um, these are just um, just uh, uh, a graphic presentation of you know. It's been growing up over the years. Gold, diamonds, bauxite. You see, diamond has been going down because at the moment, diamond Ghana produces diamond only artisanally. Hundred percent of the diamonds produced in Ghana is produced by artisanal miners. We don't have any formal uh, major formal diamond producers, but the others are, and you can see the figures. Uh, keep going up. And I've just indicated the contributions. Uh, since 2000, gold has dominated the merchandise sector, the uh, you know, revenue from the export sector. And they, they still, but, but politicians still talk about cocoa, which is interesting. In fact, not too long ago, our head of state also spoke about cocoa as a leading uh, contributor of foreign exchange. But it is not the leading contributor. It's the mining sector by far. Yet, you know, it gets forgotten. So I've spoken about the, uh, the, the internal revenue. Now, what are some of the challenges um, of using regulation in Ghana? And this is where I am going to share some of my own personal experiences in, in this area. First of all, Ghana, at least since the 80s, uh, since the introduction of... Um, structural adjustment program, actually moved quite a lot of its policy from command and control to sort of a, a, a new liberal uh, system. So, um, and, and part of it specifically for the mining sector was to come out with new regulations, new laws that sought to uh, attract investors. And so, for, and, and, and the effect is what we have seen. Now, the challenges that we see now, first, and then I'm, I'm, I'm just going to limit myself to about four of them. Um, multiple regulations. The, the, the mining sector is the only sector that is quite heavily regulated in Ghana and I believe in most part of Africa. Uh, in Ghana, there are at least 
six institutions that regulate the mining sector. Um, and, and obviously, when you have multiple uh, institutions regulating the sector, the tendency for conflict is quite obvious. And you, know, so, and you see that, and I'll share one example. Um, in fact, there had been serious fight between the Minerals Commission, which I headed, um, uh, uh, and, and the EPA, the, over the management, the regulation of uh, tailings down. The Minerals Commission thinks that it's got the regulatory right on tailings dam. The EPA thinks it, it has to pronounce on the management of the tailings dam. And that, that, that conflict has raged on for a very long time. This is just only one example, and, and there are several of them that, a couple of more of them that you, you find in the book. Now, another problem is the capacity of regulators, and I think it is not peculiar to Ghana. I'm sure when you go to most of these, um, uh, most of our uh, uh, you know, uh, countries, you would find similar challenges. And I, I share one example. Um, in, in the Minerals Commission, just before I left, there were about 220 staff uh, there. Out of that, less than 40% were technical. I mean, 40, less than 40% of the staff was technical. And out of the, 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 the ones that are technically oriented, um, about 60% were over 55 years. So they were they're gradually going to go out. And, and, and see, the numbers are not only small, the technical people are gradually going out, and there was a need for serious attention. And that, another problem is political interference. Ghana did very well by creating the Minerals Commission that is supposed to be constitutionally independent body, in quotes. And, uh, and, and, and which meant that to get a, a mining lease, you didn't have to go to the minister, like it happens in other countries. You don't have to go to the minister. Your application was for first come, first served basis, and you have to go through this so-called autonomous body called uh, the Minerals Commission before it finally goes to uh, the minister. And in fact, the law says that even when the minister had issues with that uh, and it is not approving, he has to refer the issue back to the, the commission. I think the idea was very, very good, but normally, and, and, and generally there have been much less political interference, but you see a lot of, um, well, over time, these things happening. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we were in the process, well, the, normally it happens when there's a change of government. The new government comes and it is suspicious of everybody. Everybody in the, I'm sure it happens everywhere. And that uh, they think that whatever action you were taking, you would take against them. I don't know where that came from. But uh, then the minister announces, um, we, have, we have sacked nine district officers. No process, no re reference to, uh, to the conditions of service, nothing. Or when you are in the process of recruiting, maybe it's an stop or the recruitment. Why? Because they are supposed to be autonomous and we're supposed to, and we pay ourselves. We are not even you know, paid by. So these are some of the challenges. And of course, the balance, balancing act of dealing with the LSM, the large scale mining companies and the small scale mining companies. You know the proliferation of small scale mining companies there, and, and, and some of them also working in the area of, um, of uh, uh, so these are the, of, of the large scale mining. Now these are just the concluding remarks. First of all, we think that the role of natural resource extraction in socioeconomic development and transformation of resource and dot countries is not a myth anymore. I think it's something that we need to accept. I think what we, once we accept the realities, we will try to understand the, the gamut of things around it. It, it. This means that we need to strengthen our regulatory institutions and build their capacities. Politicians should allow the professional institutions to work. Um, I think we need to improve interinstitutional collaboration and partnership rather than keeping our head, heads, uh, you know, sort of knocking our heads against each other. Um, then, of course, we need regulation by as in assistance, not by insistence. In most jurisdictions, the regulator thinks that is a policeman around, and therefore all it has to do is to crack the whip. I think that thing is long gone. We need to be more assisting in regulating than uh, insisting. And of course, we must uh, reduce uh, bureaucracy through the wise use of technology. And finally, I was rather you know, uh, thrilled by what I saw in, um, in Australia, where they have a one-stop shop, shop regulatory uh, institution. So I have always uh, suggested that to my government, that let's look at that. So you come in, 
you, you, you want something, and then what comes out is the final product. You don't have to travel here to another regulator, to another regulator, and before you, you have your project coming. It's already um, uh, unimportant. So thank you very much.